Good afternoon and welcome to today's webinar exploring carbon removals, technologies, challenges and opportunities. This webinar is the second webinar of our six webinar Climate Action Chatter series. If you want to have a look at the recording of our first webinar or if you want to sign up for one of the remaining webinars, feel free to scan the QR code. We will also send it around later, don't worry about it. And then let's go into some housekeeping rules for today's webinar. If you have any questions, please send them through the question box. We will have a Q&A at the end of today's webinar. If we do not have the time to answer your question, don't worry, our question will be noted and addressed later. Today's speakers are Leo, Leo is a senior sustainability advisor and head of heavy industries in Europe. And Adam, Adam is a senior portfolio manager for carbon dioxide removals. My name is Ramon Vasa. I'm today's moderator. And with that, I'm showing you the agenda for today's webinar. We will start with setting the scene and take a step back and discuss what are carbon removals. Then we'll look into why they are important and how they should be integrated in a sustainability strategy. And at the end, Adam will take us through some examples from the ground and show us where we are with carbon removals right now. A few words to South Pole. South Pole is a sustainability solutions provider with a 17 year of history. South Pole is the largest climate action project developer globally, and our team of over 1,300 experts is spread all over the globe in more than 30 offices. And with this, I'm handing over to Leo. Thank you so much, Ramon, and hi, everyone. Uh, good day to wherever you are sitting. Thanks a lot for having me. Um, so today, I'm going to start with setting the scene on what are carbon removals. So this can be looked at from a climate project side where emissions are always quantified in tons of CO2. And there you can actually differentiate between carbon avoidance uh, credits or carbon avoidance. So that is when a ton of CO2 or several tons ideally are being stopped or avoided from being released into the atmosphere. A carbon removal on the other hand is if you remove CO2 from the atmosphere and store it permanently. To exemplify this on a few projects, uh, here are some examples. But later, Adam will gonna, uh, gonna show you some real life examples on the removal projects. Uh, the reason you're probably here for as well. So um, on the avoidance side, at top left corner, uh, you can differentiate more also between nature-based and technological. So a uh, forest protection project typically would be a nature-based avoidance project, or then on the technological side, it can be a renewable energy project. On, for carbon removals on the nature-based side, there are project technologies such as soil carbon or also wetlands, sometimes referred to as blue carbon, or typically afforestation reforestation projects. On the technical side, again, there will be more details on this, but just to give you a few examples, biochar is also a bit of a hybrid sometimes. People refer to it as nature-based or technological uh, type of project. Uh, there's direct air capture or other projects uh, that do mineralization, for instance. So with these examples in mind, um, I want to ask relevant questions. Why even carbon removals? Why are they important? And the easiest way to answer this is to turn towards science. Um, and there the message is very clear. It does simply not work without carbon removals or net negative emissions, uh, which is yeah, an um, same thing, but with a different name. So basically, if you look at the 1.5 degree scenario uh, in this picture here, it's very, very important that we uh, avoid our emissions very strongly. Uh, however, no matter how strongly we're gonna um, avoid the emissions globally, 
we're going to need to have to address a part of these emissions with net negative emissions projects or all the efforts. Um, and basically, only this way we can achieve the scenarios. Um, this doesn't mean you should stop avoiding emissions now, right? It's an effort. Um, it's always also cheaper to avoid emissions than to having it to remove. Uh, more on that later as well. Um, nevertheless, there's a few considerations that you should uh, be aware of. Also, keep that in mind for, for the next part as well. So for avoidance projects, these are, I would say, the classical projects out there in the market as well. Uh, they are very well established um, and they have very high standards that are continuously evolving as well. Um, they also have further benefits that can only be replicated very difficultly um, if you um, try to do this with removal projects. Mainly these are impacts on biodiversity and climate justice in the global south. Then they are also uh, often more affordable. And um, however, you have to be very careful on what claims you're gonna make with these type of projects, especially the latest development uh, around regulations uh, when it comes to claims related to climate action. For the carbon removal projects, also called CDR projects, so carbon dioxide removal, um, there it is very important to keep in mind that these are kind of there for, for the long game, right? So also by IPCC report, it's they say that by 2050, latest, we have to remove 10 gigatons to achieve this 1.5 degree scenario shown before. So it's already super important to invest into these technologies now so they can be at scale when we actually need them. However, um, there's way uh, fewer projects out there in the markets. Uh, that are actually certified so keep a very good eye on the quality standards because this is key uh, and you need to be able to justify towards stakeholders as well that these uh, projects are of high quality and permanence a last consideration but also more details on this later is the pricing as there are so few prices are often uh, way higher and triple or even quadruple digits um, when it comes to one ton of co2 removed so in the next part, I want to really focus on how this could look like now on a corporate level. You have seen before um, kind of how it looks on a global level. Uh, we're going to now scale this down on the corporate level. Uh, so on the next slide, this is kind of the same slide, but again, it's on a corporate level, for instance. Here, you're going to have similar challenges as our global community has. Um, that there's too many emissions. And first thing that is key for every climate strategy in any business is that you have to focus on reduction. Reducing your emissions is very key. So you see here the business as usual scenario in yellow uh, for a corporate. It's also a very optimistic one, right? Because it even decreases. There's some scenarios, if you do nothing, emissions will increase uh, largely. Um, so, again, I want to stress, very important to reduce your emissions. Um, nevertheless, some companies, some sectors will have difficulties to address and to reduce all of their emissions. So, it's very important to also, um, what you do not manage to reduce in your own supply chain, in your own value chain, which is often, by the way, also um, the most affordable way. Uh, if you don't manage that, consider to help others to reduce their emissions. Um, it's also often called beyond value chain mitigation. Uh, so funding climate action now is very important through the, scaling, uh, through the scalable mechanisms that we have in place. We know they are not perfect, but it's one of the only mechanisms that we have. Um, that's also very much stressed by bodies like the SPTI and uh, show the importance for action today. Then, the last part of this graph here as well, and of every uh, sustainability strategy, should also be the neutralization part. So for the residual emissions, also bodies such as uh, the SPTI, again, they acknowledge that you are able or allowed to uh, neutralize up to 10% of your residual emissions to claim net zero. And only then you should call yourself net zero. So 
in a nutshell, that's how an ideal strategy looks like. Um, again, besides your own reduction efforts, um, there's parts that rely on a credible climate action portfolio. And how that could look like, I want to show you in the next slide. So here again, we are turning towards science uh, that help us also a bit uh, to prioritize the right technology at the right time. And here the Oxford principles actually give us a good overview on how such a strategy, how such a portfolio could look like over time on a global scale. But this can also be adopted on a corporate scale into your own strategy. Um, so the main focus in the beginning is uh, to focus on avoided emissions uh, through short-lived storages. These are typically, for instance, renewable energy projects. Um, ideally, these projects in the future will not be necessary anymore, right? Because they become the status quo. However, there's still a lot of countries out there where renewable energy um, is not a status quo. They have a quite dirty energy mix, oil and gas heavy. So it's important to scale these technologies in such areas in order to achieve the 1.5 degree scenario. Then as the next priority, look into carbon removal with short-lived storage. Uh, this is now also uh, available. Maybe on the one before as well, we can also do an example on forest protection, right? So it's always cheaper and more effective to avoid cutting down trees than having to plant them anew. Um, so again, that's the logic behind these principles. Uh, on the second part, it's mainly focused on removal of short-lived storage, so uh, afforestation, uh, reforestation or soil carbon projects. As a third part, emission reductions with long-lived storage. Um, so to give you an example there, there's going to be an industry, there's uh, lots of industries out there that do not manage to completely avoid their emissions. So they're going to heavily rely on carbon capture. However, parts of these emissions that they're going to capture actually are not from biogenic sources. So they would not be considered net negative emissions or carbon removals. Um, these are only carbon capture of um, fossil, uh, fo fossil sources. Nevertheless, it's very important um, to address these and also to scale these technologies that are able to, to capture these emissions. And then last but not least, the focus of today's uh, webinar is carbon removals with a long-lived storage. Um, you see some of the examples below here, and Adam's going to show you some of them in more detail in a minute. But before we go into this discussion, also some consideration on the so-called technical carbon removals, so the ones with the long-lived storage and the green ones from before. Um, it's very important to mention that this is still an extremely nascent market. Also to compare this with other types of projects, if you look back, all the emissions that have removed so far, they amount to 4 million tons of CO2. Uh, that's how much we were able to remove uh, from the atmosphere thus far um, that have been invested into. Uh, if you compare this to the whole market, um, and that's here shown is only the voluntary carbon market. Alone in the last year, 2022, there was 160 million tons of CO2 um, addressed through such projects. And you see how much this market still needs to scale. So that's something to keep in mind um, because currently the market is not there yet. And that's also often mainly driven for infrastructure, which still has to be built. That's also the reason why these type of projects currently are still uh, that expensive, but also still need so much scaling. Um, and this is going to be a very important market in the future. Um, some say it will going to be the size of the current oil and gas market. So it's also a huge opportunity out there to, uh, to uh, invest in such projects now. Um, and the last thing um, that I already mentioned, but again, is important to highlight is quality. Uh, the standards are not quite there yet. So focusing on quality standards and high quality project is very key when you think about investing to such um, nice projects. And to give you some examples now, I'm going to hand over to Adam, um, who's going to bring them to life for you. 
Thanks, Leo. And um, yeah, thanks everyone for joining today. Excited to um, to show some of the work that we're doing at South Pole on this topic. Um, if we can go to the next slide. I'll quickly do a, a bit of a sense check on where we are with tech removals and um, maybe a bit about each different technology as well. So definitely the one that um, in the market today is the most readily available would be biochar. Um, so what biochar is, is it's a porous, almost charcoal-like um, material that is produced by um, combusting uh, biogenic waste, typically, um, without the presence of oxygen. And you create this porous material that is very good um, as a potential mitigation measure for droughts because it absorbs water. Um, and at the same time, it can also, uh, sorry, to mitigate floods. At the same time, it can um, mitigate droughts because it holds onto that water, right? And it also has some useful fertilizer properties as well. Um, this one is available. Uh, we saw the first couple of credits come online two or three years ago now in this space. Um, and it's only continued to go from height to height since then. Um, it's still not at the millions of tons per year scale, but we're definitely in the thousands of tons per year scale with this technology at the moment with some good high quality um, methodologies available as well, both through Puro.Earth and uh, VCS or uh, Vera there. Um, the other ones are maybe um, a little bit less mature in terms of uh, available technologies, but they are quickly, quickly catching up. So we have bikers or biomass with carbon removal and storage, which is essentially taking biogenic CO2. Oftentimes, there's many different approaches to this one, but heating it up, um, potentially producing energy, either in the form of heat or electricity. And then often in the past, you know, of a waste to energy facility, that CO2 would have been vented to the atmosphere. What, they do, what they're proposing to do now is actually capture the CO2, um, transport it, and then permanently store it in geological sequestration where it should remain for thousands to potentially millions of years. Um, the first projects for both this one and then direct air capture, which is the same, but we don't have the, um, the biogenic element there. So we capture the CO2 directly from the atmosphere with this one. These will both come online around about 2025, early 2025. Um, and for direct air capture, I'll, I will explore in more detail our projects in a couple of slides time as well on that one. And then there's a couple of other ones which are a bit more early stage. One of these is product mineralization, which is storing captured CO2 in cements and asphalts and other usable products that we can utilize in our in our built environment. Um, and then finally, enhanced weathering, which takes a natural process um, and speeds up by orders of magnitude. Um, essentially, when, when we have rain, we have uh, weak carbonic acid um, produced, which reacts with certain rock types and can actually store CO2 that way. So what I'm really showing you here is we call tech removals kind of a bucket, but then under the hood, there are many different technologies that we're looking to scale at different times. Um, all are important and it's too early to say at this point which will be the most important one so it's very important that we don't just already choose at this point you know which is our panacea let's say um if we can go to the next slide i'll show you how on a high level south pole is um looking into you know these challenges that leo leo brought out and then how are we trying to address them so the first one um which was actually the last point leo leo mentioned is around quality and making sure that we have high quality standards out there for these um, technologies to really ensure that we are um, comparing apples to apples, right? So if we look at a direct air capture plant in America, that we can compare it to a direct air capture plant in Norway, let's say, um, and be sure by whatever they're claiming, they're using the same methodology to make their, those claims in terms of the amount of carbon that they are removing. Um, so we can we can assess how how effective they are. And at the same time, it's very important, of course, for environmental integrity to make sure that when we're trying to remove carbon, we're not exacerbating a problem elsewhere in some other way. So the way that we're addressing this is through the CCS Plus initiative. Um, this is a essentially a, a industry led consortium um, that are developing methodologies alongside Vera um, across the whole range of technical carbon removal and also some uh, carbon technical carbon avoidance project types. And I'll give an um, example of that in a second. The second one to build the market, we have a, um, a AMC or a advanced market um, contributions through our next gen CDR facility. 
And this is where a, a group of buyers um, are actually offering long term fixed priced offtake agreements to different projects in this space to really give them and also crucially their investors the vote of confidence that there is a market that is beginning to form here and we are building this market to ensure that um, once these technologies come online, there, there is someone there to finance it to ensure that we can reach the scale we need with tech removals. And then more of a local context in Europe, we have our subsidiary called Airfix, which is creating a network for um, bioenergy, biomass with carbon removal and storage. Um, if we can go to the next slide. So firstly, if I focus on the CCS Plus initiative, so like I said, this is creating the methodologies for these different technologies we have. So in a nutshell, it's a robust accounting framework that looks at different capture sources. So how are we actually capturing this CO2? How you transport it? And then how are we storing it? Um, and an example here from Switzerland comes from Seeker. So they joined the CCS Plus initiative last year to develop um, a suite of technologies known as product mineralization. Um, really bringing their expertise from working on this on the ground in industry and combining with our carbon consultants to develop these methodologies and get the feedback from Vera um, to make sure that we can produce something that is as of high quality as possible um, and also usable in, in the industry as well. Um, so what they do is they take um, CO2, normally from a biogenic or an atmospheric um, origin, and then inject it into um, concrete demolition to um, to essentially bind that CO2 to this usable product and then this usable product can be used um, in you know many different um, areas in our built environment you know it, for them it can be as concrete recycling so reusing concrete but then other examples can be used um, to produce um, asphalts that say for our roads as well um, and this stops two ways right so it can be one way to um, binds that CO2 that we've captured um, either directly or indirectly from the atmosphere into a usable product where it should stay there for thousands to millions of years. Um, or, or and I should say, um, it stops demolished um, concrete from going straight to landfill. So it can almost give a second life to some of these technologies as well. Um, if we go to the next slide. So then on the next gen side, this is our advanced purchase um, commitment that we have um, alongside five different buyers at the moment, which are Mitsui OSK lines, UBS, BCG, LGT and um, Swissery. So essentially these buyers um, have committed their money, which allows us to go out there and find the most um, advanced technical carbon removal projects in the world that fit our um, eligibility criteria and then create a portfolio of carbon removals here for these projects offering them um, uh, an offtake agreement every year up until 2030 um, to be able to scale their projects and show that there is a um, revenue stream possible from these technologies so back in April this year we announced three different projects one bikers one direct air catcher and one biochar project for this um, facility, purchasing almost 200,000 tons um, over the seven year period. And just as an example here, I have one of them, which is Project Stratos, which is a direct air catcher facility um, in Texas in the US. And what this does is essentially large fans capture, um, well, multiple fans, I should say, capture large amounts of CO2 directly from the air. They, um, they have reactors in there which bind with this CO2 in the air and remove it from the rest of the air, from the nitrogen and from the oxygen and um, everything else. And then they pump this CO2 um, to geological storage, which is um, it's known as a class six aquifer. So it's um, regulated by the US government where it will remain there stored for thousands, tens of thousands of years. Um, and it will be monitored as well, of course, that was very important. Um, and none of this CO2 will be used for enhanced oil recovery in this project. So all of it will be bound there permanently um, at the same time. And this project will uh, sequester 500,000 tons per year. And they have um, plans to scale this up to 70 different facilities across the world um, in the coming decades as well. So this is really an example of a cutting edge um, facility at this scale. Um, that will come online in 2025 and we're really giving that market confidence that this is something that we want to support and we want to um, 
build a market out of to ensure that we can have carbon removals at scale. And then if I can go on to my final slide, which is on Airfix, so our subsidiary um, for biomass for carbon removal and storage. This is essentially opening up the European market to the voluntary carbon market in, in different ways. Um, so firstly, it supports biogenic CO2 emitters. So across Europe, we have multiple sources of bio, biogenic CO2 that are emitted to the atmosphere, right? So this can either be waste to energy facilities or sewage sludge treatment or even um, biogas facilities, let's say. Um, all of these are looking for a way to decarbonize their operations, either being mandated um, in their local areas or um, because they see it as a, something that they should be doing. Um, and this is a way of capturing the CO2 and then building out that transport infrastructure and working with all the partners across the value chain um, in order to get that CO2 to the eventual storage places where we can then pump it underground um, into deep geological aquifers um, where it should remain permanently stored. Um, you can almost think of this and alongside the direct air catcher facility as reverse oil and gas mining. So where um, historically there was oil and gas trapped underground for millions of years and it remained there permanently, um, we can replace this um, with CO2 um, and then cap it. So then it should remain there for the same period of time um, to in, in order to make sure it stays out of our atmosphere. Um, and then once we've done this, of course, we need to build a market out of it to make sure that someone can help to fund these activities. So Airfix links up um, these projects with different uh, potential certificate buyers as well in this space um, in order to help fund this on a local context and then eventually to open up to investors and partners to scale this um, much more widely across the world. And they have large ambitions to remove 5 million tons of CO2 over the next um, 10 years with the first removal is expected to um, take place in Switzerland um, in 2026. And I should say that the CCS Plus initiative um, is developing the methodologies right now and the first are at public consultation. Um, NextGen is open to new buyers at the moment as well. So if there's any interest in that, then please reach out. Um, and again, with the Airfix side, if you, if you fall into any of those three categories on the right there, please let us know. Um, and we're more than happy to have a conversation on that front as well. And then on that note, I will um, open up the q and I'll pass over to Ramon to, um, to lead this. Thank you so much, Adam and Leo. And we can start off with uh, the Q&A. So the first question we received, Adam, you mentioned that CO2 would be stored in concrete. What happens to the CO2 if the building, the concrete was used for gets replaced or taken down? Yeah, great question. Um, so it, apart from a couple of um, very unlikely scenarios, um, if the building is demolished, then worst case scenario, the CO2 ends up in landfill, right? But then the, the, the concrete, sorry, ends up in landfill. Um, but then the CO2 is still bound to this concrete. So it will still remain permanently out of the atmosphere um, in, in this state anyway. There's only a couple of um, situations where it could end up into the atmosphere and um, I'll explain them just to show how unlikely they are. One is um, dumping the concrete into an acid bath. Um, this could release the CO2. Um, and the second one would be to heat it up to very high temperatures. Um, again, in a lot of areas of the world where we're not expecting any volcanic eruptions, this is also very unlikely to happen. Um, so those are, the, those are the two situations where it could, but in a nutshell, most of the time it will remain permanently locked up even after um, the end of life of that material. Thank you so much, Adam. And then another question maybe for Leo. Are projects either carbon avoidance or removal only or are there projects with a carbon avoidance and a carbon removal part? Yeah, great question. Actually, it can be all of the above. Uh, so there is some example, it can be both. And uh, in the certification mechanism so far, there's no clear differentiation between the two. Um, but that's, for instance, something CCS Plus is working on to make clear differentiation. So to give you an example on, for instance, a typical forest protection project, do you always also do a, some type of reforestation parts of this project? However, this is not accounted to as removal. 
Uh, and to give another example, on the other side, um, there might be uh, CO2 capture from a mixed flue gas stream, uh, some uh, of uh, fossil sources and some of biogenic sources uh, of CO2. Um, so there can also be a mix, but again, super important to differentiate that in the methodologies. That's why uh, these methods are there. Thank you so much, Leo. Then another question we received. Why don't we just focus on avoidance and emission reductions for now and then removal starting in 2040 until 2050? Maybe I can take this one. Um, the simple answer is that if we wait until 2040, let's say, to begin scaling tech removals, we will never get to the scale that we need to. Um, we've seen this with other technologies, right? With um, let's say solar panels back in 1960s, they were very, very expensive, you know, over a hundred dollar per watt hour. Um, and they were only really used in a few niche situations, such as on satellites. Um, over time through multiple deployments um, and the expansion out of something called rights law, we see that um, with doubling of deployment, we see a reduction in cost over time. Um, and we need to see something similar in the technical carbon removal space to be able to hit that gigaton um, scale that we will need in 20, 2050. So right now we are at the um, hundreds of thousands of tons per year level, and we need to get to billions of tons per year level. The only way to do that is to continue to deploy now and hopefully reduce the cost over time as we have more deployments and more economies of scale um, in order to have the technologies at the scale that we need them um, in the mid part of this of this century. Thank you, Adam. Then we have a, a question about uh, the direct air capture site in Texas. What sources of energy does it use and how is it powered? Yeah, I, I can take that one. So um, the sources of energy there is completely net negative, I should say, to begin with. Um, the technology is being developed by a Canadian firm called Carbon Engineering. And if anyone is interested, there are um, multiple papers that this company has released really showing the the breakdown here. Um, it's essentially using uh, renewable energy for the most part, and then some what they call responsibly sourced um, natural gas to reach the high temperatures that they need in the short term to be able to um, re-release the CO2 from the um, absorbance essentially. Um, but this is all accounted for and the CO2 released from this natural gas is also pumped to storage um, and re is remains there permanently over the long term as well. And maybe a little bit more general, is there an issue regarding the high demand of energy in, techno, in technical carbon removal solutions? Uh, it, that's a, <laughs> there's a very nuanced answer there. Um, and I think it would depend who you ask. It depends on which technology and over which time frame, right? So that's why it's too early to say right now which technology we should put all of our, um, we should bet on, let's say, as a planet. Um, and probably the answer is that we need to have multiple technologies here. Um, any solution that we have has certain potential drawbacks and certain benefits. So for example, if we look at bioenergy with carbon removal and storage, we actually have the potential to produce energy, produce more energy than we um, use here because you um, essentially can combust that biogenic matter um, and then produce heat and electricity and store the carbon. Um, in other areas, you know, it would definitely not make sense to divert renewable energy from use in, in other industrial processes or in our homes, let's say, to be used for carbon removal. Um, but there are certain parts of the world, you know, namely high solar penetration, um, such as in parts of Texas and let's say geothermal power in, in Iceland, where it does make sense. And we have a surplus of um, low carbon energy that we can put into things like direct air capture in order to, um, to scale it up in these areas as well. Thank you, Adam. Um, maybe one for Leo. What is the role of the voluntary carbon market in the carbon removal activities? That's a great question. Um, it's a bit of a personal opinion, or what I see from observations is that the regulatory mandatory policies and rules and laws are extremely important. However, they are lacking behind on this topic. 
And I see the, the voluntary carbon market as the frontier uh, where the exploration and the evol evolving uh, of such technologies and standards and quantification efforts can happen. So ideally, um, the voluntary carbon market is paving the way for the people, for the organizations that want to be front runners, frontiers and invest now for the rest to follow. Thank you very much. Then we have a question around the biochar technology. Does biochar degrade over time? Uh, I could take that one. Um, yes, is a short answer. There's a there's a degradation curve that we you can map out as well on this one. Um, depends quite a lot on the different physical properties of the feedstock and then how it was produced. So, so something called the HCC org ratio um, and the temperature. Um, typically, you see a degradation up until, well, it depends on, on the type, but around 100 years is much, much quicker than um, past this point. And what the methodologies do at the moment, um, at least Puro and the VCS one, um, they set the permanence for or the durability for 100 years. So they look at how much biochar will still be um, left in the soil or in the, in the application. Um, after 100 years, and that's the amount of carbon removals that you can claim from this one. Um, we can filter this out to 1,000 years as well, and we've done this, um, this modeling ourselves to see how much will remain over that time frame, if, if that is of interest to, to anyone to follow up with as well. Thank you, Adam. And maybe another one for you. It sounded like almost all the removal technologies require some physical space to store. Could this become a bottleneck in the future? Um, <laughs> I hope so. I mean, if we get to that stage, we've removed a lot of carbon. Um, let's just say that. So there's uh, there's many studies out there showing the potential to store um, billions of tons in the North Sea already. Um, there's one already permitted site in North Dakota that can store a billion tons of carbon removal there as well. Um, and then that's not to mention the potential that um, certain companies are looking into of other types of storage as well with, um, let's say, CarbFix and Seller, who are basically mineralizing the CO2 and pumping it down with water to then create a rock underground in Iceland and Kenya. Um, in, a, in, in, a, in a nutshell, no, we're not going to run out of potential geological sequestration. Maybe I can so add on this briefly because I had very important or very interesting input from uh, a scientist at ETH, um, and he showed a, a very nice graph uh, of the maps of the geological storage spaces uh, across the world. And there's certainly enough rock formations for that. Uh, so we have more space to store um, than CO2 to, to uh, store there, actually. However, the question will be, uh, can we build the infrastructure to access them? Um, I think that is the key question we should ask ourselves. Um, but also with the small efforts that we're doing now, this, yeah, I can just uh, uh, confirm what Adam said. There's enough space. The question is to, to get it there. Thank you so much, Leo. And looking at the time, maybe one final question for you, Leo. How would you address carbon removal within your annual sustainability report to compensate scope three emissions? How would I address this? So it's a, it's a tricky question because so far um, there's little regulation how to account for carbon removals. What we have is the evolving standard of SBTI, they acknowledge them, uh, but only up to 10%, uh, sometimes only 5% of your emissions that you can address to be neutralized, right? Um, for the rest, it also depends. Uh, are you investing in this project? Is this project in your own value chain? If it's in your own value chain, your own site maybe, that could be a typical uh, reduction measure, right? So it really depends on the context uh, and what type of project it is. But uh, we have very uh, dedicated and uh, knowledgeable staff on this one. So feel free to reach out to us. And maybe just a follow-up question, how important will carbon removals be for the CDP rating in the future? Yeah, same answer. Uh, it's evolving, uh, but what we know now is positive signals. They have a, they have a high importance. 
Um, nevertheless, also SBTI is emphasizing the importance of beyond value chain mitigation, and that also involves avoidance projects. So I hope that was clear enough in, in the overview that I did today. Ideally, your recipe has all of the ingredients. Uh, otherwise, it will be a little bit of a dull menu as well to uh, speak metaphorically. Thank you so much to both of you. And thank you, everyone, for joining today's session. Please uh, sign up for the next webinars. Our next webinar uh, on August 30th will look into ensuring excellence, quality assurance in climate action. Feel free to sign up now. Um, maybe as a heads up, we will send a recording and the slides of this webinar within the next week and you will get all the links via email.